talk. So it's really hard for him. And, and uh, I know that many of you have friends that are going through stuff, but, but it's yet another one of the things of this whole COVID thing. So that's about that. This morning, I want to jump back to the Bible in the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible. We've been looking at Revelation, and we're in chapter 8. I want to read all the way from chapter 8, verse 6, to the end of the chapter. It introduces us with the, in chapter 8 with the opening of the seventh seal. The seven seals were placed upon the title deed of the earth. Who is worthy to open the scroll and to loosen the seals thereof was the cry going out in heaven. John began to weep because nobody was found worthy to loose the scrolls or to open the seals thereof. And then the angel pointed him, or rather the elder pointed him and says, don't weep, or as the King James, I believe, says, why weepest thou? Don't weep. Behold the lion of the tribe of Judah. And he looked, and behold, it was a lamb as though it had been slain. And as he opened the scroll and began to loose the seals thereof, the reason he was able to do that, as the text says, is because you were slain. And you purchased men with God, for God. And because of that basis, because of his sacrifice and redemption of mankind, he was the only one that was found worthy in heaven or on earth to open the scrolls or to loose the seals thereof. And as he began to open the scrolls, with the opening of each of the seals on that scroll, the one scroll, the title deed of the earth, there was a judgment upon the earth, but the judgment, as we saw and as we'll see again, was a preparation for the coming of the king. That is, the earth is being prepared for the coming of our king. And so therefore, after those sixth and then seventh seal is opened in chapter 8 and verse 1, so the scroll is completely opened now. Now John says that, behold, I saw seven angels. And those seven angels had seven trumpets to blow. And chapter 8 continues with and ends with the first four trumpets that ensue the complete opening of the seals. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 6, and it says, Now the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to blow them. And the first angel blew his trumpet, and there was followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown into the earth, and a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood. <clears throat> a third of the living creatures in the sea died. And a third of the ships were destroyed. In verse 10, the third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood. And many people died from the water because it had been bit made bitter. And the fourth angel blew his trumpet. And a third of the, angel, the, the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. And then I looked, verse 13, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew overhead, woe, woe, woe to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Let's pray. God, I'm very grateful for your word. As David said in Psalm 119, that thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. And that whole psalm is about basically saying that when my heart is freaking out, I can go to the scripture, which is true. It's truth. And it sets my heart at ease. And God, I thank you for the word. You said in John 15 that the word of God cleanses us that there's a purifying effect in our hearts. It comforts us, it guides us, it leads us. We don't worship the scripture because as you said, these are the scriptures that testify of me. And so we don't fall into the category of people, the Pharisees we could call them, that are biblio idolatrous. But we are those who worship the God of the Bible. And we ask God that these scriptures would be comforting to those who are seeking to know you. And it would also be instructing on how we ought to behave in an ever-darkening world. Lord, I pray that we would have the right heart as we view these judgments, because there's a perversion in man that can begin to rejoice in the day of the Lord. That is not the heart of you. You said your judgment is your strange work. And so I ask God that you give clarity here this morning, that you would bind the work of our enemy, the enemy of our soul, because we are in a spiritual conflict. 
that he's a liar, he's a deceiver. He transforms himself into an angel of light, pretending to be our friend, but he's not. Keep us from becoming high-minded. And I ask, God, that you would give your name the glory and the honor and the power and the dominion that it is due. Let us in our hearts set apart you as Lord. So heal our hearts and forgive our sins. Bind the work of our enemy. Put the blood of Christ upon this place. And give clarity to this teacher who has many divergent thoughts running in his mind. Let these witness yet again a miracle of your grace that you, in fact, are the teacher. We praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as we talked about last week, I think the study of prophecy is a little bit complicated of a subject. The Bible has some 66 different books written by multitudes of authors, written in three different languages, Greek, Aramaic, and Hebrew. Over 1,100 chapters, as we said, was not exactly a light Sunday morning afternoon read. It's a complication. It takes time, as we suggested. It's the dedication of a person's life. But because people, and you and I, are this way by, by nature, we don't want to kind of spend the time just give me the good parts, we say. We kind of take shortcuts, or at least we're prone to it. You're the person that was, was given a book in high school, perhaps, and that book was like the, you know, the love and war, or peace and war, war and peace, there it is, war and peace, which I have read, by the way, but you want to give you the cliff notes. You don't want to read the whole thing. It's going to take too long, which, by the way, it's a fabulous book. But nonetheless, as you begin to kind of navigate the Bible, you approach it with the same heart. You're saying, boy, there's a lot to know here, and there is. It's not complicated. There's a context. Once you learn a few bits of information in the context and how to read it and, and just to kind of take it, the Bible says what it means. It means what it says. It was written in a way for man to understand it, thus the Koine Greek, which means the common Greek. It wasn't the highfalutin Greek, <laughs> to put it in our language. It was the common language of the people. But when I approach the scripture and look at the vastness of it, the, the amount of it, I can begin to despair. And so what becomes attractive, I was talking to Andrew about this the other day, what becomes attractive is I become attracted to systematic theology as opposed to a biblical theology. And many people don't know the difference. A systematic theology, though, is a system of theology. In other words, you would take concepts and look at those concepts as they're carried out through the entirety of the Bible. So if you want to learn about angels, you don't study the whole Bible to find out about angels. You just study angels in the Bible. And then you develop a theology on angels. And in fact, I've taught classes on it. Systematic theology is not wrong in and of itself if your foundation is biblical theology. But I've taught whole classes on angelology. I've taught classes on pneumatology, the study of the person of the Holy Spirit. But if you begin to just focus on the nature of the Holy Spirit, you can actually miss things and even misrepresent things. And at the same time, there's different uh, salvation, soteriological systems of theology. One of those systems might be something like Calvinism or Arminianism. People say, well, which one are you? I said, I'm neither. I'm a Christian. And they say, well, categorize yourself. I don't have to. It's the idea that you have to be one or the other. No, you don't. And you say, well, I'd like to debate you. Fine, I'll win. The reality is, is that you don't have to choose a side because both of them come out of Augustinianism, where he basically is the headwaters of both of those views with the figurative interpretation of the text. So the idea that you have to be one or the other is not exactly the case. And why do I say that? Because there's things within the text that violate both. There's things that disagree with both opinions. So when you, you're, you're at that point in time saying, am I going to stick with my systematic theology that took a concept and carried it through the Bible? Or am I going to stick with a biblical theology, which just says the Bible says what it means, it means what it says. And when the Bible seems to contradict what my system of theology says, I choose the Bible. But you know somebody that's not very honest? They twist the Bible to meet their system of theology. One of the more confusing, the most confusing, and I don't mean to pick on Calvinists, but it's fun. <laughs> so, the, but the, 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 one of the more confusing commentaries that you would ever read is a commentary on Hebrews chapter 6. In Hebrews chapter 6, it says, those who have tasted of the heavenly gift and have turned away, there's no chance for repentance. 
And that violates the, the strict kind of logical progression of, of a Calvinistic system, and yet the Bible says what it means. It means what it says. If it's not possible to drift away from your faith, why is the book of Hebrews even written? What's the point of the argument? Hey, better be careful. You don't you become a drifting, doubting, dullness of hearing, departing, despising Christian. But don't worry, you can't. Why is it warning me against something that is not possible? Why is 13 chapters of the Bible dedicated to an argument written in brilliance, but don't worry at the end of it, none of this is happening? No, the reality is, is the reason it warns us against these things is because they're possibilities. God warns his people in measures to prevent them from exercising their free will. I don't have to serve God. I don't have to love him. I don't have to honor him. I don't have to live for him. As I was telling here someone this morning, we don't do this for our health. It's kind of like, well, I'm in the ministry. The hours are long, but the pay is bad. Hmm. You know, it's like, <laughs> we don't do this for our health. I choose to do it. I have to make decisions on certain things. So when people come to certain systems of theology, that's why I was telling a pastor friend of mine the other day, I said, you can always tell a Calvinist, but you can't tell him much. <laughs> and so the reality is, is there's a lot to know, but you have to realize, and might as well just continue the argument of picking on them, and they're friends of mine. I, I love these guys, and they're Christians, and we're brothers in the Lord. It's just that, you know, <laughs> what the world needs is more geniuses with humility. There's so few of us left. <laughs> you know, I'm joking. Um, no, I'm joking. But you begin to look at these types of systems. The problem is when you look at the system and look at a systematic theology, that's all you see, and you ignore all the other vast parts. So what happens is, is in this case, or in the case of pre-tribulations or post-tribulations or any kind of systematic subject matter on the Bible, you use, let's say, post-tribulations. I want to pick on something else. And you use that as the filter, and you pour the Bible through the filter of post-tribulationism, and all the verses that don't have anything to do with post-tribulation filter out, and all the ones that do support the argument you keep. And you begin to ignore the vast amount of things that ran through your filter, and you focus in on just that that is systematic theology. It's the same with Calvinism, same with Arminianism. You say, well, the filter isn't post-tribulationism, the filter is Calvinism. And so you pour the Bible, the whole of the Bible, through Calvinism, and what flows out is completely ignored. But what's not ignored is the whole quantity of verses I've collected. Another verse that you'll be thoroughly, I was talking with Greg Devoyne here this last week, uh, went out there and spent some time with his family and got to know his grandson. I love talking to young people. I love uh, trying to make them laugh. He's this super cool kind of muscular uh, young kid that Colby is his name, and he's uh, one of the, the football players, you know, and football players are so cool, and I am so not. I, I challenged him. I said, you know what? I said, hey, how about this? Me and you, you play football? I said, yeah, let's go over to the grass right now. You and me, you versus me. I can take you down. He wouldn't do it. I'm thinking, score. <laughs> I was going, but on the inside, I was going, please, Jesus, don't let him say yes. You know? <laughs> but... but and I'm joking around with them. I got on Instagram. I've never been on Instagram before. And I just got on it this last week. And I said, I, said, uh, I, I got on there and I found him. And I, I, I you know, follow. I, what a weird thing, you know, to kind of follow you. Are you stalking me? That would be super. You know, it's like, <laughs> I follow you now. And so he, I get on there and I, he accepts it. And I'm like, oh, this is sweet. And so just one word to him, besties, question mark. He signs back, sure. So I've been spending the whole week. And I'm intent on doing this for the next year of giving him the wisdom of Ben. You know, I shared some of it with you young people this morning. The first one was, oh, I don't know if I should say, well, why not? Who cares? The, uh, I, said, you, I said, you know, the young people, this is young people humor. I said, you know, friendship, here it is right here, right here. I see you in the back, Jeff's granddaughter. I said, you know, friendship is like peeing yourself. I said, it's obvious to everybody, but you're the one that feels its warmth. <laughs> So, so, I, so I'm gonna, see, they thought it was funny. They did. They, the adults did. No, and it's um, I'm cheap for a laugh. But when you get into the Bible, you realize there's a whole lot. I'm not even gonna try to pick up where I left off. There's a whole lot of context. There's a whole lot of context within the passage that is completely ignored in our attempts at the Scripture. 
And then we become so confident that what I'm believing is true. So as I said in Zechariah chapter 1, you want confusion. Zechariah chapter 1, here's a verse. Draw near to me, and I'll draw near to you. That's God speaking. Now, if I hold Calvinism as the doctrine of all things, that violates Calvinism, therefore I ignore it. But being a good Bible teacher, I can't ignore it. So you want to read one of the most confusing commentaries on this earth? It takes the simple statement, draw near to me, and I'll draw near you. Read John Calvin's commentary on it. It's page upon page upon page upon page to explain what that really means. The Bible was not written to not be understood. I'm going to suggest to you when God says, draw near to me, you take the action first, then I'll draw near to you. What God means by that literally in the Hebrew is, <clears throat> draw near to me and I'll draw near to you. But you see, that's one of the verses that filters through. Or they so convolute it with doublespeak that you can't take it at its simple statements. And usually when people are considered to be profound and brilliant is that they take complicated things, sprinkle it with truth, and then leave you strangely confused. And you go, he's brilliant. He's not brilliant. He's confused. There's a difference between genius and idiots. Genius knows his limits. (laughs) And so... (laughs) He doesn't know everything. And when you look at the Bible, it is a complicated book, but not because it's meant to be complicated. It's because there's a lot. And that's where the Bible talks about you have to take the totality of the Scripture. Acts chapter 20, he says, I have not failed to declare unto you the whole counsel of the Word of God, not the parts that I like, and then consider myself an expert on everything. When I was first learning eschatology, I only saw eschatology in the Bible. Eschatology is in the Bible, about a third of it. But what you end up doing is ignoring the other two-thirds, and you become an expert so that whatever it is I think I see becomes a tootsie roll to me. And that's not the way to approach the Scripture. So there's a difference between a systematic theology and a biblical theology. Biblical theology, on the other hand, is going to take a few years. You're just not understanding the context of the book. But when was it written? Under what historical context was it written? I have to know the kings and the chronicles in order to know that. Who is the author? What was the argument that was being made? What are the subtleties in the language? It just takes a little bit of time. What do other scholars upon the language say about the interpretation? And I begin to read this and study it, and it's not a quick learn. It's much easier just to look for verses that support my preconceived ideas. Take them out of context. Make them say, you know, it's kind of like this, is that people that do this, they go on to the strongest concordance, which scholastically is not exactly the, it's a quick reference guide, you know? It's kind of like um, if you said, you know, I'm eating a hot dog. And 2,000 years from now, they would look back and see how we wrote a paper about how we ate a hot dog. And they said, well, in the original Greek, we looked up hot, and it means sweaty. And then a dog, it's a small animal that barks. So in the Greek, it's a hot dog. Those barbaric people, they were eating their sweaty puppies on a regular basis at ball games. How dare they eat hot dogs? And they make a whole argument about how we ate hot dogs. And it's like, that's not what it means. You have to have the grammatical, historical interpretation. Sometimes people confuse that with the literal interpretation. The literal interpretation would say, hot dogs. We don't take a literalistic view. We take a grammatical historical view. How is the word used in the context within the text and the context of the culture? It takes a little bit of study, not just plagiarism of your favorite commentators to tell you what you already believe. You know, it's kind of like um, when people are looking for counsel from somebody else, what they're looking for is uh, someone to agree with them what their conscience has already d- convicted them about. <laughs> I want some counsel. Will somebody else agree with me? Because I know what I'm doing is wrong, so I'm looking for counsel. And they reject the counsel that tells them what they don't want to hear and accept the counsel they do. And that's the insincerity that is oftentimes given in the approach to the Scripture. So when you introduce prophecy, which, as I suggested to you, takes a totality of the Scripture. You should not be teaching the book of Revelation on the learning curve of other people. You should be teaching the book of Revelation like the Hebrews did in the Old Testament. They wouldn't let their young men even read the book of Ezekiel, the great prophecy book of the Old Testament, until they were 30 years old. 
Why? Because they knew the propensity of sophomoric people to twist it. Remember when you're in high school, you have freshman, sophomore, junior, and senior, right? Four grades. Where we got our word sophomoric. Sophomoric, you guys know what this word means, right? You don't. Sophomoric means that you know a little bit and you think you know a lot. You really don't. So what happens? You're a freshman. You're scared to death. You don't know anything, but you play the part. I know nothing. I know nothing. Just survive today. Yeah, you get home. You're like, oh, sweet Lord, I didn't die. And you do this for about, you know, the whole school year, nine months in a row. And then finally you graduate and you walk back the next year and you can hear the Bee Gees playing in the background. Well, you can't tell by the way I use my walk. I'm a woman's man. No time. And you are now an expert on all things because you're a sophomore. You're not a junior or a senior, but you're a sophomore. And sophomoric is the idea that you now have passed the test. I actually read a book of the Bible. Granted, it was Philemon, but I read it, you know, as one chapter. And so, so you're this expert. I memorized a Bible verse. Which one? John 11:35. 35. What does it say? Jesus wept. <laughs> so, wow, expert, tell me more. And you learn a narrow sliver of something, and from that you build this confidence. The Bible is not all about angels. The Bible is not all about pneumatology. The Bible is not all about soteriology or eschatology, but I would suggest this to you. In order to understand eschatology properly, you have to have a thorough understanding of the all lot of the rest. And that's why sometimes I've listened to things. I know I've sat with my dad as we've listened to different men comment on things, and it's kind of interesting at our house, some, at least when I was younger, we'd want to pick up a baseball bat and throw it at the computer or throw it at the screen because like, are you kidding me? People buy this, but they don't know. You can pull it off on people that know nothing. I was once playing a chess game and it, it beat me, frustrating. It's no match for me at kickboxing <laughs> with that thing in shape. But, but so you get frustrated. <laughs> Man, it's bad when people don't even laugh at this. I mean, that, that was hilarious. And I have to tell you that it was hilarious. But I have a propensity to begin to be having preconceived ideas that I begin to look at the scripture and read it through that. So when, when, when somebody, as I said, is along that lines of myopia, we should call her Sister Myopia. <laughs> Sister of the whole unholy denunciation. Um, no, the uh, sister myopia, she's so, she, that's all she sees. This myopia means narrow-sightedness. That's all you, and because of that, that myopic type of a view, you ignore vast parts of scripture, but then when a study of prophecy is imposed upon those people in Calvinism, for instance, let's pick on them again. When it's imposed upon them, usually the Calvinist that is expert in all things knows nothing about eschatology because if there was a serious study, and I can't take the time to prove it to you this morning, I can prove it to you if you want to talk to me afterwards, but if you take the time to have a serious eschatological study and impose it into the doctrines of Calvinism, you come to some very scary conclusions if you're going to interpret the Bible consistently. And that's why I've suggested in a little booklet I wrote years ago that to be a Calvinist, you have to be a post-tribulationist and you have to be an amillennialist. And I, I can't get into the details this morning. And they were like, well, wait a second here. I don't really believe that Jesus is going to come back and rule upon the earth like the Bible says. Yeah, if you're going to interpret the passages that you interpret according to Calvinism in a consistent manner carried out. And sometimes it takes too much time or patience of the people to be, be able to hear your argument and proof to begin to navigate those types of things. So the narrow understanding, when you have this revelation of Jesus Christ, the totality, he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. All of this book is about me. Then you impose it upon their limited viewpoints. They blow up and they can't handle it because I need to reinforce myself that I know everything so they always gravitate back to a context where they can remain experts in all things in their unholy denunciation of myopia. So in the scripture itself, and I'm getting to a point, believe it or not, in the scripture itself, there's a difference between the eisegesis and the exegesis. And what that simply means is you can either insert things into the text 
or you can extract things out of the text. I think when we were studying the book of Romans years ago, the example I gave was marinating chicken. I don't know if any of you remember that. When you're marinating chicken, you can inject things into the chicken that aren't there. How many people know that lemon does not grow within a chicken? (laughs) Nor oregano or any garlic. Garlic did not grow within that chicken. You're injecting it. I said, Jesus, you're injecting a meaning into the text. Look, there's a bear in the book of Daniel. That's the Germans. Or that's the Russians. Now, does the text say it's the Russians? No. You know what it says? It's a bear. But does the text say that? No, you've just injected something into the text that is not there. That's eisegesis. You're putting lemon in there, and you're making the chicken taste like lemon. But on the other hand, there's the eisegesis. You take a raw chicken, you put it in the crock pot, you fill it with water, and you let it simmer overnight, and you wake up in the morning, you have this delicious chunk of meat with deliciously soupy water that you don't throw away. (laughs) You reuse it. And that is extracting exegesis, pulling out of the chicken only something that was in the chicken. That's how you interpret the Bible. And some people inject things into it, lemons and herbs and all these things. You go, man, that was a fabulous meal. Yeah, it was a fabulous meal. But a few things were added to the text that aren't actually there. In fact, if you take away the lemon and the oregano and the salt and pepper, it actually doesn't taste as good. But when you just use the chicken, wow, you got the pure chicken. Now, in terms of cooking, I'm all for those spices, by the way. But in terms of the Bible, the danger is you can put diesel fuel in there. Hey, come to our church. We put diesel fuel in our chicken, and you can develop a taste for diesel fuel. And like, wow, it's not the word of God unless I taste a little, little, uh, you know, octane. <laughs> it's like, wait, who started you on the diet of diesel fuel? Well, I've been having diesel fuel for my childhood. Okay, go back to the Bible. Is there diesel fuel in the chicken? Well, no, but I've been putting it in there for so long, it's got to be true. It's not. And you always have to go back to the Word of God. I'm not the expert. The credibility that I have is only to the degree that I rightly divide this. Would you agree? And you're not the expert but neither am I. And it only works when you begin to say, okay, what does the word say? And there has to be humility if there's actually going to be a growth and a knowledge. So I would suggest to you that before you even begin to read the book of Revelation or study it on any level, you actually have to know somebody. You know who it is? God. And if you don't know God, you're going to interpret what he's doing through your own heart. And when I don't know God, yet I see what is going on, and I interpret it through my own heart, I'm going to get a little bit afraid, and I'm going to interpret the text through my fears, and then I'm going to react according to my fears so that those things don't happen to me. And what I'd suggest to you is that people have forgotten that the book starts as a revelation of Jesus Christ. The same Jesus in John chapter 14 that says, "If if you see me, you've seen the Father. The same Jesus who saw the woman caught in adultery and says, sin no more. He didn't say, just pretend your sin wasn't sin. And nobody cast any stone. He didn't say that. He said, you need to acknowledge this, and you need to turn from what you've acknowledged. That's called confessing your sin. I had a person tell me, he's like, oh, you you who's without sin, let him cast the first stone. But you're committing adultery. You need to repent, and then you can be forgiven. But don't throw Bible verses around just to justify a lifestyle that will lead you to hell. God can forgive you. He'll cleanse you. He'll cast your sins as far as the east or from the west. But don't you begin to act like the grace of God, as Jude warns, is there as a license to commit sin. You have to take the whole counsel of the word of God. They're picking, cherry-picking to to allow us to believe and to live the way that we want with a semi-clear conscience, though no man has a clear conscience in sin. Maybe a seared one, but not a clear one. And so before I read the word, I have to know God. And the difference between knowing someone and knowing about them is a world of difference. I, I've never met Abraham Lincoln, but I know, I know about him. And people can know about God, but not know him. 
And we take those conceptions of God into a passage like the one we just read. So when we read this passage, was and honest, it doesn't do us any good to play the hypocrite and Pharisee, but honestly, quietness of your own heart. When we read this, was there something in your heart saying, yeah, God, get them! <laughs> There's a fear basis that has been driving an interpretive method that has caused you to come to some unfortunate conclusions that misrepresent the heart of God while you are confident you're standing on the word of God. You're not standing on the word of God any differently than the Pharisees who quoted their scriptures were standing on the word of God. And Jesus said to them in John chapter 5, you study the scripture and you think that by that you possess eternal life. These are actually the scriptures that talk about me. And they were convinced that they were rightly relating. The Bible tells us in the book of Isaiah that God said, my wrath is my strange work. We read the book of Revelation, we say his wrath is his ready and constant work, and boy, he is happy to do it. Go get him, God. We're on the right side. <laughs> and he said in Ezekiel in chapter 18 and 33, I don't delight in the death of a wicked man. Do we? Do we delight in the day of God's wrath? Is our hope the coming of our Lord that, Lord, I want to be with you? You know, you can have two different reasons you want the rapture to happen. One is just to get the heck out of here. Now, I understand the temptation, but we have a job to do, so show up to work. Be light. See, all I do is just be light? Yep, be light. And once in a while, he'll tap you on the shoulder and say, hey, talk to that guy, so talk to him. But be light. We got a job to do. We got a job. And God says, I don't delight in the death of anyone and so I think it's important that you inject the heart of God into the text, not just the strict word of God, which our wicked hearts can select. You know, I think about people getting together and starting to have a relationship with one another. And all of us, everybody's a little bit. The key to a relationship is get them hooked before they find out just how weird you are. <laughs> that's, that's, that's the key. I'm joking, of course. We're all a little bit weird, and life is a little bit weird. And I think when people get together, we find someone whose weirdness is compatible with ours, and so we join up with them and fall into a mutual satisfying weirdness, and we call it love. As the Princess Bride says, true love. <laughs> we call it love. <laughs> but the objective of the Christian Though God is not weird, it's to bring ourselves into alignment with him and unite to him. And so it's with the heart of love that we're supposed to approach these passages. And so I look at Matthew chapter 24 and how it correlates to the judgments that have been taking place upon the earth. Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3, it says, And as he sat, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives, this is the Olivet Discourse, the great prophecy chapter of the Gospels, as Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, tell us when these things will be, what will be the sign of the coming, of your coming, and of the end of the age? Three questions. And Jesus answered them, saying, see that no one leads you astray, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they'll lead many astray. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not alarmed, for this must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are but the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. The, 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 the evidence, if you love me, you'll love one another. The evidence is this betrayal of love in the last days, that the people are going to be convinced they're right. But he says that's actually the proof that we're not. And then later on in verse 29, he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. 
And so when you read Matthew chapter 24 and the Olivet Discourse, and those of you that have been with us in Revelation in chapter 6, you realize rather quickly that there's a coordination of the thoughts that are taking place. In Matthew chapter 4 and 5, the first thing he says is, see that no one deceives you. There's going to be a false Christ that's going to come upon the scene. So we're not surprised. The very first thing in Revelation chapter 6 is he sees a white rider on a white horse. And this one was what we talked about, the false Messiah. He comes upon the scene in Revelation chapter 6, 1 and 2. Likewise, in Matthew chapter 24 and verses 6 through 8, he says, there'll be wars and rumors of wars. These must happen and take place. We talked about this in detail at the beginning of chapter 6, that there was two dynamics that were happening. God was dismantling the cosmos. The cosmos is that system of man that is antithetical to who God is. It's man's system of government as though God is not true. We're practical atheists, whether we're boldly and pronouncedly ones or not. And therefore, in Matthew chapter 24, 6 through 8, God begins to dismantle the system of the Antichrist, not by him taking an active judgment, but by allowing the system to judge itself. So the first thing was that there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. People are going to be fighting with each other. I'm going to allow the cosmos to dismantle itself, and then I'm going to allow the earth to dismantle the cosmos. There's going to be earthquakes. There's going to be things upon this earth that are going to make sure that that likewise begins to dismantle the systems of man. And so likewise, in Revelation in chapter 6 and verses 3 through 8, he says, when he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, come, and out of another horse, bright red, its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that the people should slay one another. See, this war is rumored, they're killing each other. Fine, you don't want me, the prince of peace? Have your way. God's judgment is allowing them to do what they want. And he has given them a great sword. In verse 5, he says, when he opened the third seal, the third living creature says, come, and I saw... And behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And he heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil or the wine. What's going to happen next? A destruction of the food chain. And you know what's interesting in Revelation, as well as in Exodus, and through the whole of the Bible, for that matter? God's judgment is allowing the people, the desire of their heart, they said, get out of our schools, God, get out of our churches, get out of our government, get out of our families. God says, your will be done. And he allows the people to suffer the consequence of his removal in part, in time, so that perhaps, maybe, seeing the consequences of this, they'll decide that they don't want to be removed from him for all of eternity. It's called hell. And his warnings come in measures. So hyperinflation, the food costs are going to go through the roof. Hmm, weird. (laughs) And then he opened the fourth seal in verse 7. And I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and its rider's name was Death. And Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and famine and the pestilence and the wild beasts of the earth. And so what you see in these first few seals, it correlates perfectly with the wars and rumors of wars in Matthew chapter 24. In verses 9 and 10 of Matthew chapter 24, look what it says. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and put you to death. He says men are going to betray one another and hate one another. Well, look at the fifth seal in Revelation in chapter 6. In verse 9, he says, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. Jesus said in in John chapter 16, the day's coming when men will actually kill you and they're truly going to believe that what they're doing is from God. God told me to do this. God is purifying his church and I'm the hand to do it. I say, time out. The only people God uses to judge his church are non-believers. You better hope you're not the one that God's using It's a loud statement of who you are. The Assyrians are the rod of my anger. The Assyrians, the Babylonians, Habakkuk chapter 1. The Babylonians? We have to be very careful. That doesn't mean we can't disagree with something that's going on in the church. I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that you can't say, hey, this is wrong. But to say that you are the one to decide 
who are believers and not. And therefore, you're going to add your helping hand to make sure that the false ones are exposed and removed is a sure sign that you're not on the side you think you are. (laughs) Satan is still the accuser of the brethren, but they overcame by the blood of the Lamb. He says in verse 29 of Matthew chapter 24, as we already read, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light. Interesting. At the beginning of the tribulation, so we saw it in Revelation chapter 6, the sun and the moon and the stars are darkened. At the end of the tribulation, according to Matthew 24, the sun and the moon and the stars are darkened. This is interesting. Because what takes place here in Revelation in chapter 8, as we just read, in Revelation in chapter 8, under the fourth seal, look what it says in verse 12. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, that a third of their light might be darkened, a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. This is in the middle of the tribulation. At the beginning, it goes dark, but apparently it becomes bright again. At the end, it goes dark, and then a new heaven and a new earth. But in between, it says, and throughout the whole passage, a third, a third, a third, a third. Why not all the grass? God says, nope, just a third of it. Why not all the water? Nope, just a third of it. Why not all the sun? Nope, just a third of it. And people argue about the nature of the third. Is it partially occluded for the totality of the day, or is it completely occluded for a third of the day? And I say, I don't know. It doesn't tell me, so I don't inject something into it. I just take what it says. I say, I don't know. But why does it say a third? For this reason, God's judgments are always in measures. God's judgments are in measures. God never comes and says, oh, yeah, I'm going to give you my judgment now, and all 6,000 pounds falls on you at once. He says, nope, I'm going to throw 10 pounds on their back, sometimes to purify you, sometimes to confront you. It's not our job to figure out which one. It's our job to say, Jesus, help. (laughs) But God's judgments come in measures. I was trying to figure out what I'm trying to say here in this passage. I, I said, like dating, not everything is given at once. Oh, that was the joke I told earlier. You don't let everyone find out how weird you are all at once. Okay, that's, that, that's what that was. <laughs> Professional and good Bible teachers wouldn't do this. Just me. But God doesn't give you everything at once, either good or bad, right? Right? Doesn't the Bible says faithful in little, faithful in? He doesn't say, hey, look, you're a born again Christian. Born again Christian. Guess what, Billy Graham? <laughs> the yay multitudes are going to fill the steady eye of America and come to listen to <clears throat> you. <laughs> Thank you very much, God. <laughs> I'm just your humble servant. You're so wise. <laughs> it's the Lord. I'm just the one he chose in all of his wisdom. <laughs> But the Bible tells us, faithful in little, faithful in much. One of the gambles in raising up his servants is part of that raising up is the very real trials and temptations. My mother told my dad, or told me about my dad years ago. She said, every time your God was going to use your dad in a new way, there was a brokenness that happened right before, and it was always a deep brokenness before he used your dad in a new way, and I found that to be true. That's why we don't lose heart as Christians. That's why we believe James chapter 1. You face trials of many kinds, consider it pure joy, because it's going to produce something for eternity. In time, yeah, it sucks. Pastors aren't supposed to say it. It sucks. (laughs) It really does. But we enter into faith and say, God, what are you going to procure in this? You can become bitter. You know, the only trial you don't learn from is the worst trial, the wasted trial, is the one you don't learn from, rather. And you don't learn from a trial that you become bitter in. You can be hurt. You can cry. I've done plenty of both. But I don't become bitter. I refuse to be bitter. I absolutely... You know what I look at bitterness like? Poison. I say, why am I going to bite that pill? No, thank you. I refuse to be bitter. 
though maybe sometimes people want me to be. I'm not, I'm not, there's not an ounce of bitterness in me for life. But there's a gamble because God puts his servants increasingly faithful and little, faithful and much, increased trials to begin to say, I'm going to procure something for eternity. And the child of God begins to say, God, I trust you in this. It hurts, but I trust you. And you are good. That's what Chuck Smith said. When you face things in life you don't understand, fall back on what you do understand. I've done a lot of falling back on what I understand. But the good things in life come in good measures. They don't all come at once. There's a development of the blessings of God in your life. It doesn't all come at once. James says you ask God for something and God doesn't give it to you because he knows that if he gave it to you right now, you would use it on your own lust. So he builds you into the man you're called to be and then he gives you. You know what's funny? I look at my own life. I have nothing. I own nothing, but I feel like I'm the richest man on earth. (laughs) I really do, financially speaking. I know nothing. And yet I feel like I'm the richest man on earth. Because whatever I actually want, one, I'm content with everything. I'm content living in a hut. And those of you that have smelled me, I mean, spent time with me, would know that's true. (laughs) But godliness with contentment is great gain in many ways, more than one. But the fact is, is that I don't need this or that to be happy. And yet... There's been times where the desire in my heart has come so strong. It's like, man, I always wanted to go to Fiji. Who doesn't? I didn't live the totality of my life seeking Fiji, but I was just like, Lord, I really want to go to Fiji. All of a sudden, I get plane tickets for like $300 to go to Fiji. I said, we're going to Fiji. (laughs) I can go to Fiji cheaper than I can go to Hawaii. And I don't pursue these things. But James says, God doesn't answer your prayers because, and and I realize, God makes some people really wealthy. And I'm not bitter against them because I know that God didn't do that with me in his wisdom. Maybe he'll do it when I'm older, but he hasn't done it yet. But I trust him because God knows that I probably wouldn't walk with him or something. I think I'm past that trial, quite honestly. But God knows that some people, you wouldn't walk with him if you got all of that. The very fact that people that have an abundance and they're walking with Jesus, it's pretty cool. But it's also true of bad things. That's why I said God's warnings are intermittent periods of his grace. He doesn't give you everything in bad measure either. He begins to warn and say, don't do this, don't do this, don't go here, don't go there. So that when you see a loved one or a friend go down a path, you're saying, what the heck happened? It was so sudden from our perspective, no. God had been warning them over and over. He's faithful. He's faithful. And they hardened their heart. And the best thing is to give them over so that hopefully their body can be destroyed, as Paul says, never by us, but let them have the fun that they think is fun. And that's why I said two weeks ago, I said, if you love something, set it free. But don't be surprised if it comes back with herpes. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> it's like, it's like you, you let them free. And so the Bible says in the day of adversity, stop and consider. Okay, God, why is this bad stuff happening? Is it just a struggle? What's going on? And so I look at the passage and I see the ecological destruction, a third, a third, a third of the the heavens, the earth, the water, the seas. But is this just God flexing his muscles? I mean, couldn't he just come in and say, done, couldn't we just skip all of this and be right at Revelation 20? In 21, behold, I saw heaven and earth fly away, and God's judging the righteous. Couldn't he just jump? Why all these chapters, right? Is God weak? Is he unable to bring about his accomplishment? You know, God can lift a lot, but not that much. I mean, so what he has to do is lift, you know, kind of like us at the gym. You, you, can, you can't bench 1,000 pounds. If you can, maybe you could. I could see you doing that, but, I could, but most guys probably couldn't. And so what you can do is put 100 pounds on there and bench it 10 times. You say, look, I lifted 1,000 pounds. Well, yeah, but not really. I mean, is that what God is? Well, I can't do it all at once, but I'm going to work it in measures, 100 pounds at a time, because God's weak. Is that, what we, is that the theology? Of we? Why is God waiting? 
Why is he taking so long? Why not just jump to the good parts if that's how wicked our hearts are? No, God can do it in an instant. Then why does he take his time? I would suggest to you in verse 13, the last verse of the chapter, and you'll be going, we're finally done. (laughs) The last verse of the chapter is an evidence that, in fact, this is a warning. And as I just said, God's warnings are periods of his grace. You're driving down the freeway, and you see sudden destruction ahead. You see the sign up. It's back blocking up. And I, I was looking at my... I was doing Spotify in the car, and I realized that Idaho is now hands-free zone. I just moved from Montana, right? So I broke the law. I feel terrible. But, but I have this car that it tells me to brake. It's like, and it flashes up on the windshield. I don't know how that is. It says, brake! The traffic all kind of piled up. How dare my car tell me to brake? That's so rude. What do you want me to do? Slam into it at 70 miles per hour? Where's the love? Those darn Japanese. My Acura. It's a smart car. It got too hot at my house the other day. It kind of freaked me out. And I went outside, and it was super hot. And all the windows were down just a few inches. I said, what the heck? It knew to kind of whoop, let the... It was getting too hot inside. It just automatically, with the car off, went whoop. I'm thinking, what the heck just happened here? <laughs> Why did you do that? <laughs> freaked me out. I'm like, oh man, I'm going to be at the parking lot at some store and they're going to, maybe it only does it at my house. That's what it does. And it's, some guy's going to be like, hey, look, that car just opened up. Let's jack it. You know, like, like, what the heck? What am I going to do? The brake sign comes up. I'm going to say, you're so judging me, you Japanese, those evil Japanese overlords. They programmed into my car a warning system because they hate me. I mean, would we say that? And that's the way we read scripture. And we likewise then take that same hatred towards, not us, because we love us way too much, we take it towards the heathen. (laughs) This is going to be a newsflash. The heathen are people that don't know what you know. Right? They're people that don't know what you know. So we ask for wisdom from God. How do I tell them? Or do I look at Revelation and say, ah, yeah, one day, baby, a third of your lawn's done. A third of your drinking water is out of here. A third of your land finished, and I can't wait, baby. Are you injecting your own heart into the text? Or have you taken time to to read the totality of Scripture? That he's not willing that any should perish. As the Greek literally says, any. And so verse 13 in Revelation 8, it says, Then I looked, and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice, and it flew directly overhead, Woe, 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 to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. There's a debate over whether it's angel or eagle. It's it's not that big of an issue, quite honestly. In the Greek, angel and eagle are almost exactly spelled the same. It's possible it's a corruption because later on in Revelation chapter 14, in verse 6, does it have it up there? You can get it there faster than I can look it up. Revelation 14, 6, it says, Then I heard an angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell upon the earth, to every nation, tribe, and language, and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God, give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Worship him who made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and the springs of water. So the angel is addressing the heavens, the earth, the sea and the springs of water, the same things that are being addressed here. So is it possible it's an eagle? Ah, ah, type of thing, possibly. Maybe it's a corruption because the spelling is almost exact in the Greek. So maybe it is an eagle as it is in chapter 14. I don't know. But if you'll take the time to read Genesis 1, 9 to 15, and I don't have the time here this morning because I've gone long talking about dating or something. But if you take the time, you'll see within the creation at the beginning, God created the heavens, the earth, the sea, the springs. Now the seven seals are opened. It's my earth to claim. And the first thing he does is address a third, not total judgment, but a third of the heavens, the earth, the seas, and the springs. Do you see that? God is beginning to address this. 
So as I said, I think we need to be careful in studying prophecy that we don't desire the destruction of the ungodly, as we call them. I mean, kind of, kind of <laughs> ungodly just means without God. In Amos chapter 5, it means, verse 18, do you have that verse up there? Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It's darkness and not light. Is it possible for us to say, come, Lord Jesus, come with the desire for vengeance? Yeah. Woe to you. And the passage is revealing the heart of God towards mankind, that he's not willing that any should perish. It's not all of the sun. It's a third of the sun, which it had already been blackened, but now apparently it's not again. Because he's giving men's attention to bring them to repentance because he's still not willing that any should perish. Thank you, God, for your grace and for your wisdom in the word. Help us to be those that have hearts like butter and skin like crocodiles. Keep us from pride that thinks, us, thinks that because of the few bits of information we know, we know everything. Let us honor you in the way we read the word, teach the word, but more importantly, how we go out and live the word. Let us not live the word in our own strength, lest we become proud, but let us walk in that humble dependence upon you. where are saying, God, I assent with my mind that what you said is true, but in my flesh there dwells no good thing, and I don't have the ability to live it out. So God, I need you to live in me what I agree is right, but I don't really have the power to do it, so God, help. And it's in that attitude of humility you'll find yourself accidentally living for Jesus. Those of you that are going to be big for God, man, I tell you, you just become bitter over time and you become a Pharisee. You have to learn dependence. And it creates a humility so that you're not angry at the people that don't see what you don't see, but that what you see. And so God, I pray for humility to be in us and that we would teach the truth, but in love. Let us not be those who teach love, but no truth. Let us not be those who teach all truth, but no love. Let us teach the truth as the Bible says in love. We pray for this grace, the forgiveness and cleansing that is free 